Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, Thrombosis Canada and the Association of Immophilia Clinic Directors of Canada welcome you to tonight's webinar, Highlights from ASH, a Canadian Perspective. My name is Marc Carrier. I'm one of the hematologists in Ottawa and Secretary for Thrombosis Canada. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'll be facilitating tonight's program. Before we begin, the system has automatically muted all of the phones except for the speakers. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function to post it, and I will monitor that box and ask the questions at the end for you. Tonight's program is being recorded for archiving on the Thrombosis Canada site, and we would like to thank uh, BMS Pfizer Alliance for the unrestricted grant to support our development and delivery of the program. The content for this program was developed entirely by tonight's faculty based upon their review of the different presentations from the American Site of Hematology Conference earlier this month. Because of the tight timeline between the ASH meeting and tonight's presentation, about a week or so, so thanks to all our fabulous faculty. This, pre this presentation, uh, for this presentation, we had not been able to obtain accreditation uh, for tonight's program. Thank you for your participation. If we would go to the next slide. So we have a fabulous program for tonight. Uh, we have uh, four faculties and we'll be discussing selected topics on hemostasis. We'll have a uh, presentation on heavy menstrual bleeding and we'll have a discussion about inpatient inherited thrombophilia testing. We'll then have a TEG talk, expanding clinical roles for TEG and Rotem. And finally, we'll have a great presentation on duration of anticoagulation, one of the educational session, and we'll have a discussion about impact of ethnicity and impact of prior VTE on cancer-associated thrombosis. The faculty is really uh, exceptional, so I thank you all for your participation. We're having uh, thrombosis expertise, hemostasis expertise, internal medicine, hematology, lab-based. We're go really going from one coast to coast. So uh, thank you all uh, to Dr. Jackson, Dr. Selby, Dr. Tagalakis, and Dr. Wu. I'll be introducing them more formally uh, before their presentations. Before starting, it's always good to have a look at the disclosures and I'll just leave the slides for about five seconds so that we can have a look. And now I think we can start uh, with the disclosures of commercial support. So as mentioned, the session has uh, received support from BMS Pfizer Alliance in the form of unrestricted educational grant. All faculties have received an honorarium from the organization Thrombosis Canada uh, through uh, BMS Pfizer. It's important that BMS Pfizer's are making or makers of a Pixaban, which may or may not be discussed within this program. Without further ado, it's a great pleasure to be introducing Dr. Shannon Jackson. Dr. Jackson received her medical degree in 2001, completed her internal medicine and hematology tra training programs at the University of Calgary in 2007. She went on to complete a subspecialty fellowship in clinical hemostasis under the mentorship of Dr. Manchui Poon from the University of Calgary and has continued working with patients who have hemophilias and other bleeding disorders by joining the adult division of the British Columbia Bleeding Disorder Program based in St. Paul's Hospital. Dr. Jackson's current research interests include the study of the impact of aging on aging hemophilia population, and in particular, whether hemophiliacs develop ischemic heart disease at the same rate as the general population. She is currently studying the prevalence of disorders in collagen and bleeding disorders population and platelet characteristic in type 2B von Willebrand disease. Dr. Jackson, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Mark, and also to Thrombosis Canada for the opportunity to uh, join my esteemed colleagues and talk about the uh, uh, minority issue today, but it's wonderful to be able to do so, and, and thank you. Uh, I hope in the next 15 minutes to give you an overview of a very important gene therapy study for hemophilia B, as well as talk a little bit about Futusaran because we share common interests in this uh, rebalancing therapy. And then because we're all hematologists, lab or clinical, I wanted to talk a little bit about bleeding and other outcomes in ITP. 
So for those of you who've seen some of the previous presentations around gene therapy at ASH and other meetings, there's sort of a commonality to the types of patients who are currently being studied with this investigational therapy. They tend to be obviously males uh, who have hemophilia A or B that tends to be severe or moderately severe, and they're adults at this point. They all have been considerably treated with products in the past, but not yet or ever developed an inhibitor. And they tend to be those who have needed prophylaxis or, or at least at an intensity of therapy that creates a burden on their life. In terms of exclusion criteria, there are um, one exclusion criteria that this study that I'm going to present to you today has finally uh, over, over um, come uh, in terms of the barrier of excluding patients because they had detectable pre-existing anti-capsid AAV antibodies. And so um, the rest of the exclusion criteria tend to be related to liver function because the uh, vector is obviously targeting the hepatocytes to then allow them to generate uh, hopefully meaningful levels of factor nine. So in the uh, gene therapy field, a lot of the uh, different platforms use one or other of a AAV related uh, viral capsid, uh, human made though. And in this particular case, um, what we are going to talk about is AAV5, which formed the uh, platform. And, and this particular uh, AAV uh, has an associated anti capsid antibody rate of about 20 to 40%. And that's because in, in nature, in life, we get exposed to wild type AAV in the community. And that cross reacts with these human made uh, viral capsids. And so um, the study that I'm gonna present to you next uh, is actually in a little bit of two parts. The uh, product is called Etranicogene does a parvovec. And yes, I did have to practice that a lot, but it's uh, really what it is, is it's uh, a product that uses the background of having success with wild type factor IX gene therapy in previous um, iterations of gene therapy studies. But this time, and like many other gene therapy for factor IX, it includes the uh, hyperactive Padua variant, which many of you as thrombosis treaters will know is a thrombophilic variant in nature that was discovered uh, over 10 years ago in a family in Italy. And this particular protein has a higher specific activity around eightfold higher, which is brilliant if you're trying to uh, allow a protein to be packaged in this uh, capsule, if you will, and when transcribed, allow a much more potent restoration of the factor IX activity. So both the phase two and phase three uh, components of this study were uh, presented at ASH uh, this year. The uh, first was presented by Dr. Vanette, uh, sorry, uh, by Dr. Annette Van Dragowski. And this phase two study involved the same dosage as for the phase three HOPE study. Uh, but in this case, three patients studied all had pre-existing antibodies. And uh, after a two-year update, and unfortunately this slide's not showing up exactly correctly, patients were expressing between 36 and 52% factor nine activity, which is amazing. And so with that data, uh, the phase three HOPE study was uh, presented by Dr. Steve Pipe uh, this year as a late breaking abstract. And this study was important as it's the first and largest gene therapy study to date using um, this viral vector dose of two times 10 to the 13 viral copies per kilogram in a large number of patients. But there will be others to follow that are still continuing to use this Padua variant. So in this study, uh, 54 were included in the final analysis set. Now, going back, they actually screened about 75 patients. 67 entered the study in what we like to see as an observational period where we get baseline data on bleeding rates. Uh, and that's important because bleeding rate was one of the primary endpoints of the study. And ultimately, 54 patients had an infusion of the viral vector. Uh, of that 54, one patient actually had a reaction that the investigator deemed significant enough that they should not receive the full dose. So that patient didn't respond, but uh, they are included in the analysis. Uh, this is a fairly typical hemophilia B uh, population. Notably, about 50% of them had previous hepatitis C infection, but had to have good liver function to participate. And remarkably, 42.6%, so 23 of those 54 patients, had detectable neutralizing antibodies at baseline and entered onto this study, which is the first time such a low 
large study has done so. So on the next slide, I'm going to present you uh, one of the other primary outcomes, which was looking at factor nine activity using a one stage assay at uh, six months after gene therapy infusion. And so the arrow kind of shows here where the it's a little bit faint, but uh, where the um, mean factor nine activity ranged over those few weeks, the mean at 26 weeks was 37.2%. And uh, you can see that the uh, wide variation uh, in uh, minimum and maximum level um, exists. Part of that is because that one patient who only received part of the viral vector, of course, didn't express. And what I didn't uh, highlight for you on the previous slide is that one patient had a very, very, very high titer of anti-AAV factor eight, uh, AAV uh, neutralizing antibody, and that patient didn't show any factor nine response. So they are included in this uh, in this graphic. And during the presentation, Steve Pike clarified for us that if you didn't include those patients, 70% of subjects uh, achieved 30% or higher factor nine activity at 26 weeks, and a full 40% actually got into the quote unquote normal non hemophilia range, which is amazing. A smaller group uh, had data beyond the 26 weeks up to as long as 18 months. And as you can see, more or less continuing to show expression of that factor nine. Now, what does that mean for them clinically? Well, 98% were able to stop prophylaxis entirely. And there was a 90% drop in overall treated bleeding rate in that population, which is great. Now, um, steroid use is a common issue in um, hemophilia gene therapy trials due to a usually early um, uh, response that's directed at the hepatocytes. And indeed in, in seven patients, um, uh, sorry, nine patients were treated with um, steroids for a period of time in this part of the uh, procedure, and by 26 weeks, they were off of steroids and still able to express factor nine activity. Now, what did those pre-existing uh, neutralizing antibody titers do to their ultimate 26-week factor nine activity? Well, not a lot. If you exclude that patient that had that very high titer uh, antibody at the beginning, there was no correlation seen with the, the, the height of the uh, antibody titer at enrollment and how much factor nine activity was expressed. Now, you remember I told you that one patient had an infusion reaction and didn't finish. Another six had much more minor reactions and were able to finish the whole gene therapy uh, hour infusion. And there was no correlation between having that antibody titer and a reaction at infusion. So this is very exciting. And on to the second study now. Um, the uh, study that I'm going to present second has to do with futisiran, which most of you know is a, a short interfering RNA uh, compound that uh, allows us to treat not only uh, hemophilia A or B, but also those who have or have no inhibitor, and even plausibly um, in indications outside of those uh, disease states. This was also presented by Stephen Pipe. And the, uh, the mechanism action, I'm sure, is known widely by this group. And when we have a thrombin deficient state, such as hemophilia with or without inhibitors, um, blocking the production or transcription of uh, antithrombin uh, can rebalance coagulation, at least in theory, and uh, help these patients be liberated from their um, coagulation factor replacement or bypassing agent therapy. So I'm sure many of you have seen this study. This was a presentation of uh, data at a mean of 3.1 years following um, first dosing with the futisiran in patients who are over 18 years of age. And that this study was an extension study out of the phase one where it was more of a dose finding pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic assessment. More patients in this study were on the 80 milligrams sub Q once monthly than the 50, but both were included in this analysis. And as you can see, antithrombin suppression is pretty good uh, in around 20%, and that's sustained during the uh, time frame on the study to date. Um, in terms of efficacy, we're seeing an ABR, uh, an absolute, uh, sorry, annual bleeding rate of about zero for treated bleeds during this entire observation period, which is again amazing, both for patients who uh, have an inhibitor and those for, who don't, as well as between uh, hemophilia type. Now this slide uh, is obviously one and it's the primary one that I 
decided to uh, present this study because of, and that's the uh, adverse events. So for non-severe AEs, uh, we're seeing uh, commonly in this group uh, increased ALTs, headaches, and injection site erythema. But there have, as many of you know, been some reported SAEs in this particular uh, open, la open label extension study, one uh, atrial thrombosis and one death actually in 2017 that uh, led to a uh, revision of the guidelines for actually treating breakthrough bleeds with a reduction in the intensity of dose replacement of coagulation factor concentrate or bypassing agent, as well as a reduction in the uh, recommended duration. And uh, so, so that uh, happened. And then unfortunately, uh, in the uh, phase three program, which is the Atlas platform, uh, in late October, the uh, Sanofi voluntarily paused dosing on this particular study, as well as all of the Atlas uh, studies due to some non-fatal thrombotic events. And they are currently assessing the uh, trial and looking at um, engaging with regulatory authorities to determine what will happen and whether there'll be a further uh, uh, dose replacement for a breakthrough bleeding recommendation and whether um, they perhaps will be looking at uh, that antithrombin monitoring. So stay tuned on that, but I thought it was important to present and it really represents the crossroads really between the hemostasis and thrombosis worlds. And I, I really hope for the sake of our patients that this could be another option to liberate them from the uh, need for prophylaxis and intensive treatments. So finally, um, actually full disclosure, I was going to pre present the flight trial, which many of you may have seen during the uh, late breaking abstracts um, that presented by Charlotte Bradbury. But as she presented it, I actually uh, got a message and I thought that this study might be actually something that we could uh, uh, think about. So this was a study, it was an oral abstract presented by the group from Dana-Farber, and this is actually looking at uh, outcome measurement in ITP. And about 10 years ago, many of you will remember the International Working Group uh, presented recommendations for which for a, a consistent outcome measure, particularly with response with ITP treatments using platelet count and other ones, including bleeding and quality of life. And I, I thought this was an interesting study, and I'm going to talk for a minute or two at the end about the flight trial. So this was a, a, an appraisal, a critical review of the literature, looking at 10 years worth of papers that met their inclusion criteria, primarily uh, prospective, but a, a significant amount of retrospective studies. Of those studies, uh, only 43% 10 years later were using that international working group definition. And I'll tell you what that was in a moment. This is the group who did not use it. So this is a... Uh, group of studies that elected to use other definitions. The IWG definition is shown here with a platelet count greater than 100 for a CR and a response rate needing to be greater than or equal to 30 and at least twice the baseline platelet count. For all the other ones, you can see there was about 21 different ways that these studies looked at re response, whether it was with the absolute platelet count shown in the bottom here, um, and then uh, also with the fold uh, change from baseline represented here. Uh, so, so really telling us that people are still doing kind of their own thing. And fortunately, the flight trial did use the IWG definition, but that's not why I'm showing you this study. This is why I'm showing you this study. So of all those studies, only 36% were collecting standardized bleeding outcomes using a number of different scores as illustrated here in the table, both pediatric and adult. You can see the two common ones, the WHO and adults blue line was the most common and in pediatrics, the Buchanan addicts score to assess bleeding outcomes. And Dr. Asim Kari said something during the um, presentation that I really liked, so I'll read it to you. Despite the fact that ITP is a bleeding disorder and the fact that its impact on health related quality of life has been well documented. Most studies published in the last decade did not evaluate bleeding in any systemic way, and fewer still evaluated the impact of treatment and health-related quality of life. In fact, only 9% of studies looked at any health-related quality of life outcomes. And going back to that flight trial that I recommend that I rec mentioned at the beginning, um, many of you will have seen it. It was a, a, a trial looking at a combination of steroid and steroid and MMF in uh, primary ITP at first treatment. And they collected uh, response rates using the IWG, uh, and they also collected bleeding and quality of life info. Now, you may remember that the initial response in the first couple of weeks was similar between those two groups. But in the end, the MMF um, showed a lower treatment failure your rate at 22% in combination with steroids, then steroids alone did at 44%. Now, if you ask the investigators, there was similar toxicity between the groups and similar breeding rates. But when it came to the quality of life tools or the, the patient reported outcomes, when they looked at fatigue with, with respect to the, 
facet F uh, uh, quality of life score, uh, the rates of fatigue were much higher in the combination MMF uh, steroid arm and the rates of um, physical function and lower physical health were, were much worse in the MMF group, which really I think told me that we really need to incorporate this into our clinical studies a lot more and find out what the patient's perspective is. So in summary, uh, gene therapy for hemophilia is exciting and safe. It looks to be feasible and hopefully we'll see it uh, in our future armamentarium as it's proving very effective. Rebalancing therapies such as futisiran are continuing to show promise from an efficacy perspective, and that's based on the phase two data. And hopefully we'll see uh, on a, 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 those nuances worked out about which patients are, are best suited to that type of treatment in the rebalancing and hopefully avoiding of thrombosis. And overall, as a community, we need to do a better job of measuring outcomes in ITP. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vicky Tagalakis. Uh, she's an associate professor of medicine at McGill University and attending physician in the Department of Medicine at the Jewish General Hospital. She's the director of the Division of General Internal Medicine at McGill University. She completed an MSc in epidemiology and biostatistics at McGill University in 2003 and is a research scientist in the Center of Epidemiology and Community of Studies uh, at Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research at the Jewish General Hospital. She holds several peer review grants. She's the co-lead of the quality improvement platform of uh, CanVector, her national Network for Clinical Trials and Thrombosis. She's a CIHR funded national um, uh, researcher. Dr. Tagalakis' uh, principal research interests focus primarily on ideology mechanism of VTE and VT outcomes, primarily in cancer patients. She has expertise in research methodologies, including pharmacoepidemiology pertaining to thrombosis related analyses of large administrative databases. She is a uh, she has been awarded numerous peer-reviewed research grants for national and provincial funding agencies and has published extensively in the field of venous thrombosis. Dr. Tagalakis, welcome, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that, uh, for that introduction, and thank you to Thrombosis Canada for inviting me to provide uh, some insights as to this year's uh, selected uh, presentations at ASH that I thought were quite interesting. Um, so I decided to uh, uh, present three topics. The first is uh, an education session on heavy menstrual ble bleeding and anticoagulation management. Uh, the next is a poster presentation that actually did receive some uh, media attention at ASH, uh, having to do with the utility of inherited thrombophilia testing in the acute setting. And finally, an oral uh, presentation, and we can't go without talking about COVID-19 and venous thromboembolism. Uh, so uh, there was a po an oral presentation looking at the incidence of venous thromboembolism among hospitalized patients with cancer and COVID-19. So the first part of my presentation is on um, the issue of menstrual bleeding and heavy menstrual bleeding during anticoagulant management. Uh, just before we get into uh, heavy menstrual bleeding or abnormal bleeding, uh, just some sort of markers of what is normal. Um, so the average age of menarche is around 12 and a half to 12.7 years. The average age of menopause is around 51 years. The average menstrual cycle is around 28 days. And average duration of menses is anywhere between two to seven days. And it is thought that the median blood loss during normal menses is around 53 mils per cycle. Um, what is meant by heavy menstrual bleeding uh, indicates that uh, there's various definitions, but most agree that anything over 80 mils per, per, uh, uh, per cycle constitutes heavy menstrual bleeding. This occurs in anywhere between 10 to 30% of women in their reproductive years associated with iron deficiency and uh, deficiency with or without anemia often involves impairment of quality of life and including missed work in school days. Um, I just should mention that abnormal uterine bleeding uh, is a larger definition that includes heavy menstrual bleeding and is, as, as you can see here from the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, uh, they uh, include heavy menstrual bleeding, the fourth uh, sort of uh, point there amongst uh, their definition of abnormal uterine bleeding, and you can see some other definitions for abnormal uterine bleeding there. 
Uh, so heavy menstrual bleeding on anticoagulation does occur frequently among menstruating women. Around 70% of menstruating women will report this. Um, however, it, in, in, in uh, studies, it is something that is underreported and underdiagnosed and often not reported in the trials that we're very uh, used to hearing about when looking at anticoagulants. Uh, so what are the clinical features of heavy menstrual bleeding? So for a blood loss of over uh, 18 mils per cycle, um, often the clinical correlates include uh, the requirement of frequent changing of uh, protection more often than hourly. Um, iron uh, low ferritin is often something that is a prevalent factor, clinical factor in these women with heavy menstrual bleeding. And the reporting of clots of more than one inch uh, is also a prevalent factor. Um, the increased blood loss can be reported by patients as very heavy bleeding, changing protection overnight, uh, number of products that are used per cycle or per day are often other markers that patients will report. Um, as I mentioned earlier, heavy menstrual bleeding and abnormal uterine bleeding are not uh, a major uh, are not outcomes that are reported in most of the DOAC trials. It's only really captured through the correlate uh, of major or clinically relevant non-major bleeds. And uh, go, uh, we noted a couple of years ago, we published in 2017, um, looking at the product monographs of uh, the various DOACs. And at that time, we didn't have the reported dabigatran included, but since then we've had some information and I note that there. Um, we see that um, the rates are uh, comparing a bleeding of apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and dabicatran, comparing that uh, to low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K antagonists, you see in general that uh, there are, uh, for apixaban, similar rates. Uh, for rivaroxaban, there is uh, a significant difference between uh, rivaroxaban and low molecular weight heparin transitioning to a vitamin K antagonist. Uh, edoxaban seems to also have a similar rate when looking uh, with that comparator, our usual comparator in the DOAC trials, which was a low molecular weight heparin followed by vitamin K antagonist. And interestingly for dabigatran, uh, there was actually uh, perhaps a, uh, a protective effect um, uh, with uh, the dabigatran. Perhaps uh, the fact that dabigatran is not as commonly used in younger women, uh, given its predominance in, uh, in Canada for atrial fibrillation. So um, there is this preliminary data to suggest that rivaroxaban may be associated with, uh, with a higher incidence of heavy menstrual bleeding than the other DOACs. However, there are no head-to-head -head comparison studies uh, uh, that have looked at this issue. Um, we do know through some observational studies uh, compared to low molecular weight heparin followed by vitamin K antagonists, rivaroxaban users may uh, report more prolonged bleeding, more than eight days, uh, more likely to require an intervention, uh, more likely to modify anticoagulation, uh, and increase uh, risk of recurrent VT if uh, 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 major bleeding or heavy men menstrual bleeding does occur. Uh, and this is through the concept of stopping your anticoagulant to address the heavy menstrual bleeding, which then renders uh, the patient at a higher risk of recurrence. Um, so um, management strategies are fourfold when dealing with heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, primarily uh, uh, based on hormonal therapies, uh, followed by anticoagulation modification, uh, the use of antifibrinolytics, as well as procedural therapies. Um, now these procedural therapies obviously are quite selected uh, and in the hands of our uh, colleagues in obstetrics and gynecology and usually really um, uh, uh, um, sort of uh, say, uh, uh, targeted towards women who are non-childbearing or have completed childbearing given that uh, these procedures uh, such as uterine embolization and endometrial ablation increase the risk of, of um, uh, rendering a woman non-childbearing and obviously hysterectomy 
uh, does the same, obviously. Uh, but as uh, um, managing heavy menstrual bleeding with medications, hormonal therapies are uh, the mainstay uh, uh, therapy that is used. And you can see here from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, they uh, predominantly depend on the use of uh, contraceptive pills to be able to manage uh, this uh, heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, and so we're often faced uh, with uh, trying to determine if uh, the use of hormonal therapies in women who have suffered a venous thromboembolic event, uh, the safety of these uh, treatments vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, provoking uh, or rendering uh, a woman to be at a higher risk of recurrence. And interestingly, Martinelli and colleagues published in Blood in 2016, looking at this very issue of um, uh, risk of recurrence uh, amongst women uh, during at-risk period in women with and without concomitant hormonal therapy. And you see that the risk uh, uh, seems to be quite comparable across women who were not using hormones uh, versus women who were using a various uh, variety of hormonal therapy while on anticoagulant therapy. So it sounds like from this study that as long as a um, patient or woman remains on anticoagulation therapy uh, for their initial venous thromboembolic event, uh, the addition of a hormonal agent doesn't seem to uh, render them at a higher risk of recurrence compared to not taking a hormonal agent. Um, so when we're looking at managing heavy menstrual bleeding in these women um, on anticoagulation and soon to come off anticoagulation, um, we can divide them into combined hormonal contraceptives. The available hormonal therapies can be uh, divided into combined hormonal contraceptives, uh, which include an estrogen component versus progestin only, which do not necessarily do not include an estrogen component. And uh, the combined hormonal agents are okay, as I mentioned earlier in the previous slide during anticoagulation, but they are to be avoided if coming off of anticoagulation, given that uh, estrogens are known to increase the risk of thrombosis. Um, now, progestin only seem to be are the preferred uh, management uh, to be used given low, low risk of thrombosis with progesterone. Um, and in fact, IUD is mentioned there uh, has the advantage of also of all of these different types of progestin only contracept be an effective contraceptive a methodology as well. And is often in my clinic in consultation with a gynecologist, my go-to sort of um, uh, hormonal therapy when dealing with heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so how about after anticoagulation? So a, a woman has uh, finished uh, with her anticoagulation management for her venous thromboembolic disease and um, is experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding hormonal agents are similar to the prior graph. We would probably, we would preferentiate the use of progestin only pills and IUD or subdermal implants, which do have only uh, progesterone in them and obviously avoiding estrogen containing therapies as well as uh, dipomedoxyprogesterone. Um, although this contains a very a low estrogen, there seems to be a particularity with this uh, Dipoprovera with an excess thrombotic risk in, in addition, not just venous, but arterial. So it's something to be avoided. And obviously when discussing these therapies, um, the, the, the issue with is to also be discussing the contraceptive aspect of these therapies. Now, antifibrinolytics are also can be used in the armamentarium for dealing with heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, they're generally effective and safe to treat heavy menstrual bleeding compared, uh, and there has been a Cochrane review on this, compared to placebo, non-steroidals, and oral uh, uh, pro um, uh, progesterone pills. Uh, they do not appear to increase the risk of VT, and we can kind of infer from good trials now that have used, for example, trazodamic acid in the WOMAN trial, which looked at uh, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding immediately postpartum, and the CRASH-2 trial that looked at trauma-related bleeding. Um, we don't have any data on the combination 
of these medications with oral anticoagulation, uh, but the feeling is that uh, definitely antifibrinolytics should be used with uh, carefully with extra caution during the acute phase of uh, a DVT or a PE. The other management um, uh, that can be done is anticoagulation modification. So trying an alternative anticoagulant, uh, for example, if a patient is on rifaroxaban and switching to what are sort of uh, indirect observational data suggests that perhaps a pixaban or a doxaban or even dabigatran could be are associated with less of an issue vis-a-vis -vis heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, we should avoid holding the drug, uh, meaning the anticoagulant in this case, if we're dealing with a patient with an acute venous thromboembolic disease. Um, however, it may be doable uh, in patients with secondary prevention uh, who have been on uh, treatment for a protracted period of time, and this could potentially be a way of managing uh, a patient. Uh, other considerations when dealing with women who are reporting heavy menstrual bleeding is uh, to evaluate and treat any iron deficiency uh, that may be also uh, associated uh, with the condition uh, to discuss. Obviously, we've already talked about the importance of effective contraception and planning of future pregnancies, um, quick gynecology referrals, especially for IUD placements, um, but uh, for also for evaluation of anatomic causes for the heavy menstrual bleeding. And obviously for anybody with any postmenopausal bleeding, that should also trigger a referral to uh, gynecology. And in some cases, consideration of underlying bleeding disorders, this is the opportunity to think about that uh, in these patients, if it's appropriate given perhaps past medical history or familial history. Uh, so the next uh, abstract I wanted to talk about was the inpatient inherited thrombophilia testing uh, at an academic health center, high cost, low value. Um, so this was, um, the background to this was that we do know that inherited thrombophilia testing has been uh, uh, regarded as extremely controversial uh, following a venous and arterial thrombotic event. Do you test or not after an acute event uh, is something that um, um, is often debated. Um, we do know that in, inherited thrombophilia testing in unselected patients is really not associated with lower rates of recurrence of uh, arterial or venous thromboembolic events. It's costly, and it is associated with a high occurrence of false positives uh, when done in the acute setting, which then triggers a lot more testing. Uh, moreover, at ASH and at the American, by ASH and by the American Society of Clinical Pathologists, they have made choosing wisely recommendations against sending inherited thrombophilia tests following a provoked uh, venous thromboembolism or in the acute setting after a thrombotic event. So this study aimed to understand the ordering patterns and costs of inpatient inherited thrombophilia tests in a large academic medical center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and to determine whether the actual positive test results led to any changes in clinical management. So this was a retrospective chart review of all inpatients in the calendar year of 2019 at three major campuses and as you can see, there are a wide variety of different thrombophilic uh, testing was done. I know that antiphospholipid testing uh, was not done. Uh, this ended up being a cohort of 231 patients among whom 872 tests were sent. Um, the, uh, the researchers followed uh, these patients from index admission until end of study, December 31, 2019. And the follow-up did include any outpatient management or outpatient visits. And sort of, this is a busy slide, but this is to show that among the 231 patients, uh, the mean age was around 50. Uh, we had a, a more women than men, 55.8% were women. Uh, we noted that the reason for thrombophilia testing over half of the, re the reasons were for arterial or ischemic event, 54.5%, and 26% were for venous thromboembolic event. Um, when looking at risk factors for arterial thromboembolic events, we note that 23% had none, but 76.7% of these patients did have at least one or more risk factor.
And when looking at the venous thromboembolic uh, subcohort, um, we note that at least three, one third of these patients did have some sort of other sort of provoking risk factor. Uh, we see that among all the tests ordered, factor V Leiden was one of the most common tests that was ordered, followed by um, homocysteine levels. 83.3% uh, of all the tests were normal. 8.8% uh, were borderline positive when looking at the various uh, deficiencies, whether it was for antithrombin-3 protein S or C, and uh, including heterozygote factor V line or prothrombin, and 7.9% were positive uh, for um, these deficiencies or homozygote. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the graph here at the far right, we see that when the uh, review, when the researchers tried to determine if there was an association between the positivity of a test among patients uh, who had an arterial thrombotic event, um, and, as well as the patients who had a venous thrombolic event, the likelihood of an abnormal test was not significantly different in the cases of unprovoked VTE or arterial event without a risk factor compared to those with risk factors. Uh, moreover, among all positive tests, when the researchers tried to determine if there was a change in the management, um, there was no definitive change in management in any of the patients, possibly in two patients with factor V Leiden heterozygote gene mutation. And by change, um, the researchers uh, noted that continuation of an anticoagulant uh, defined change in this study. So in conclusion, there was a high use of, intra, of IT testing with a low yield of positivity. It was costly, over $400,000 were associated hospital costs to, uh, to these tests. And according to the researchers, there was no definitive change in clinical management. And in the, many of the abnormal tests, especially for antithrombin-3 and protein S and C testing, uh, they were below the range of normal according to their um, sort of lab uh, re clinically relevant ranges, suggesting that uh, mildly normal, sorry, mildly abnormal, <laughs> suggesting the false positives due to be, uh, were probably due to being ordered in the acute setting. Um, some comments on this paper, as I mentioned earlier, there was no APLA testing, uh, the length of follow-up was not described, mortality was not described either, but I think one of the uh, end sort of thoughts I had was that um, when looking, you know, at the fact that management uh, did not change whatsoever, the amount of tests that were done for these patients um, and the amount of resources associated with this, um, we do have guidance within Canada amongst Choosing Wisely Canada, and we do have recommendations in various other settings as to when not to do a workup. And so some of this work is in line with what we suggest, what Choosing Wisely Canada suggests, primarily in patients with first episodes of DVT with a known precipitin not to do these tests, in women with early pregnancy loss not to do these tests, um, and in patients with an unprovoked PE not to do these tests. And I think the fact is that these tests should not be done given this uh, report in an acute setting period. Uh, and the final paper looks at venous thromboembolism incidence and risk factors among hospitalized patients with cancer and COVID-19. Um, so we do know that hospitalized patients with COVID-19 do have an increased risk of both venous thromboembolism and arterial thromboembolism. Um, many now uh, sort of studies, observational studies have shown this. Um, we do know that cancer and cancer subtypes, as well as anti-cancer therapies, are well-known uh, VT risk factors, but we're not sure how these two interacting, the cancer or cancer therapies and COVID-19 status, uh, impact on VT risk, especially in patients who are hospitalized. So the aim of this study was to look at the one-month incidence of VTE and ATE, uh, stratified by ICU status, as well as active cancer therapy. And the overall goal was to try to determine predictors of uh, thromboembolic disease in these patients to eventually be able to develop a risk assessment model to predict once when patients are being admitted to hospital, who is at the highest risk of developing VTE.
So this is the COVID-19 and Cancer Consortium who developed an international retrospective cohort study to investigate the clinical course and complications of COVID-19 among adult patients with an active or previous history of cancer. We don't have really details on what is meant by previous history. Uh, there were 125 participating centers, mostly from the US, one or two from Canada and one from Spain. And this ran from March 17 to August 29, 2020. It was a chart review. Uh, VT was defined uh, as a DVTP or thrombosis of uh, no, um, not otherwise specified. And uh, AT was stroke and MI. So this, uh, from March 17, 2020 to July 31, 2020, 4,098 patients were enrolled in this registry. Patients were excluded if they had an adequate, inadequate follow-up, um, meaning less than four weeks, unless they died or had a thrombotic event, uh, were not admitted to the hospital, so they were only interested in hospitalized patients. Uh, unknown hospitalization status also was another exclusion criteria. Uh, unknown thrombotic complication status, and non-lab confirmation of COVID-19. So in the end, the population included 1,813 hospitalized patients. Um, I, uh, it was stratified according to the ICU admission. So ICU admission within 48 hours, there was 317 patients. No early ICU admission was 1,249. And unknown whether or not they ended up in the ICU was 247. And so the baseline characteristics of these patients, you can see there, um, there was a mean age, median age of 70, 45% female, uh, a variability in race or ethnicity, primarily white with 25% black, 13% Hispanic. 11% um, of the patient population had a BMI of 35 or 40 and above. Um, a few had a history of VTE. Anticoagulant pre-admission and antiplatelet pre-admission was relatively low. Um, recent anti-cancer therapy, one third of these patients had that uh, recent anti-cancer therapy. Uh, cancer remission status is noted as well. Half of them patients did were in remission, and the other half some had some sort of active cancer, whether they were progressing or responding to their therapy. And as you can see there, the common cancer subtypes were um, divided equally amongst prostate, breast, GI, lymphoma, and thoracic. Um, and so here are the rates, uh, I think overall in the hospitalized patient population, the 1,813, uh, we see that 8.8% overall got a VTE, 5.1% uh, were P alone, and 3.9% had an arterial thromboembolic event. Uh, when you compare ICU admission to ward admission or no ICU, the rates are much higher in the ICU patient population as compared to the ward patient population, so that's not too surprising. We also note within the stratum, if you look at yes to anti-cancer therapy versus no to recent anti-cancer therapy, the risks or the rates are, are, much, are higher amongst those receiving anti-cancer therapy versus those not receiving anti-cancer therapy. And you also see the fact that a ward admission with anti-cancer therapy had a rate of 10% of VTE, which is uh, comparable to the rate in the ICU patients who were not receiving anti-cancer therapy. So there is a suggestion that certainly uh, the concomitant addition of anti-cancer therapy did impact on the rate of thrombosis in this cohort. Uh, when they tried to look at different predictors, uh, you can see there that um, the early ICU admission seemed to be a predictor of thrombosis, and this is uh, venous thromboembolism. Uh, recent anti-cancer therapy also seemed to confer uh, an odds ratio of a 1.63 that was statistically significant. Um, looking at cancer subtype, uh, where they use the adapted Corana score to divide these different cancer subtypes, we see that the very high uh, risk VT cancers, and that would be lung, ovarian, uh, kidney, bladder, uh, testicular, uh, sorry, very high pancreas, stomach, and esophageal cancers, there seemed to be a, a sort of a, a gradient uh, increasing risk with these cancers compared to the, uh, the low cancer types. 
Uh, moreover, uh, these were the more uh, associations were seen with vis-a-vis -vis cancer uh, status. Uh, however, these were not uh, statistically significant. So in conclusion, uh, the authors noted that the incidence of thrombosis was high in their hospitalized patients with cancer and COVID-19. But what was particularly interesting was that ward patients with active anti-cancer therapy did have similar VT rates as our ICU patients without active therapy. And that's something I don't think we have been sort of cognizant of. Uh, and it is interesting that this was noted and particularly important in managing some of these patients uh, on our COVID wards who increasingly, as we have community spread and in our full on second wave across many of our provinces, um, you know, a lot of cancer patients we've been noting coming in and it seems like that needs to be addressed for them. Uh, and uh, for sure, early ICU admission seemed to be something else that seemed to appreciably increase the risk as well as some of the higher uh, risk cancer subtypes. Uh, these are our, you know, limitations is that this was retrospective. There was a lot of missing variables um, and, and building a RAM model uh, will require a lot more work, uh, but it does give some sort of uh, uh, fertile ground to be able uh, to direct future work in this area. And I think that is it. Thank you very much, Dr. Tagales. This is fantastic and very insightful. So without further ado, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Rita Shelby. Um, Rita, as you're putting your slides up, it's a great pleasure to be introducing Dr. Shelby. She, we should be very proud. She was one of the selected few to give an educational session at the American Society of Hematology meeting this year. She kindly agreed to give a short version of her presentation. Uh, Dr. Selby is a consultant hematologist at Sunnybrook Health Science Center in Toronto uh, and is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto who practices in the area of thrombosis and hemostasis. She's a staff hematology in charge of the special COAG laboratory, as well as the medical director of the hospital's anticoagulation management clinic. The special coagulation laboratory at the Sunnybrooks uh, conduct all of the specialized testing for the hospital's three campuses and serves as the reference laboratory for several hospitals in the Toronto East region, as well as large Canadian commercial laboratory. She has a master's in clinical epidemiology from the University of Toronto, and her research interests include clinical trials and thrombosis health services research using large databases and coagulation laboratory quality assurance. Rita, welcome, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me, uh, Mark, and to Thrombosis Canada. So my presentation at ASH this year was entitled The Tag Talk, Expanding Clinical Roles for Thromboelastography and uh, Rotational Thromboelastometry. Um, so I sort of covered, um, I explained a little bit about uh, viscoelastic assays and what Teg and Rotem are and how they work and uh, went on to appraise the evidence um, um, went on to appraise the evidence sort of supporting viscoelastic assays for both current indications, which are primarily bleeding management and certain novel clinical indications, and also um, recognize important considerations if you need to implement uh, TEG and Rotem at your institution. Um, so what these tests are, are essentially they function as a global test of coagulation performed on citrated whole blood at point of care. And um, um, when we apply a continuous rotational force to developing clot, the viscoelastic strength of the developing clot is then transmitted either to an electromechanical transducer or an optical detection uh, system and displayed as a graph. And what it tells us is simultaneously it provides both a quantitative as well as a qualitative analysis on all of the components of blood uh, formation and clot lysis. So not just the solid components, but also the soluble components. Um, uh, this is the principle of the tag. So basically uh, there's a rotating cup and uh, with citrated whole blood and a pin that's immersed into it that is attached to an electromechanical transducer. And the, in the case of the Rotem device, the cup is stationary, but the pin oscillates. 
And either through electromechanical transduction or through transmitting to a light source, you can then see a developing graph. And this is a picture of basically the TEG and the Rotom analyzers. This is the first generation, which were manual required pipetting of blood and reagents. And these are the second generation that are being used in some countries and are beginning to be licensed in North America. These have cartridge-based systems with dry reagents. So you don't need to pipette reagents and you can just apply whole blood and you get uh, simultaneous measurements of several assays, which I'll uh, discuss in a moment. Um, so these are the parameters of the tag output graph. So the first parameter is the reaction time and it's the time that it takes for the trace to reach an amplitude of two millimeters. Um, the next is uh, the kinetics, which is the time that it takes for the amplitude to reach from two to 20 millimeters, as well as the angle that's created by the developing curve. And the first uh, parameter basically assesses activation of coagulation and thrombin generation. And if there are anticoagulants in the plasma, then in the whole blood, sorry, then you will see a prolongation here. And this is the kinetics of the reaction and indicates the speed at which the clot is propagating. Um, the maximum amplitude is the strength of the clot. And that indicates how much the fibrinogen and platelets are contributing to the clot strength. And finally, once the clot is formed, the lysis parameters, lysis 30 and lysis 60, which indicate the percentage reduction in the area under the tech curve that occurs either 30 minutes or 60 minutes after the maximum amplitude has been reached. In Rotom, the parameters are slightly different. They are named differently. And between TEG and Rotom, they signify the same things, but they are not interchangeable. So the reaction time is now the CT or the clotting time. The K time is the CFT or the clot formation time, um, as well as the angle, again, signifying the speed at which the clot is propagating. The maximum amplitude is known as the maximum clot firmness. And the lysis index is the percentage of clot that's remaining once this clotting time has been reached. Um, so these are some of the assays that one can measure on the TEG and the Rotem. Um, on the TEG analyzer, there's the kaolin assay in which kaolin is an activator. And basically it signifies the pathway of contact activation. And it's like measuring the APTT. The rapid TEG uses tissue factor and kaolin as an activator. So it's like looking at the PT and the PTT combined. Um, one of the TEG assays has heparinase in it. And the heparinase neutralizes any heparin that might be present in the whole blood. So if you look at this curve and compare it to either the standard tag or the rapid tag curves, you could basically see the contribution of the heparin to the curve. And that is sort of like doing a quantitative assessment of heparin. And then the fibrinogen assay has a platelet inhibitor, a GP1B2A uh, inhibitor. So that sort of neutralizes or inhibits the platelets. And you can see what the fibrinogen contribution is to the clot, sort of like how you do a fibrinogen activity in the lab. Same assays are present in the tag 6 except that there are four channels now. Uh, on the Rotem system, the contact activation is by ellagic acid. There's a tissue factor assay called XTEM. There's a heparinase assay called HEPTEM. So if you compare the HEPTEM graph with the INTEM, you can see how much the heparin is uh, contributing to the graph. And then the FibTEM has a platelet inhibitor, sort of similar to TEG. And in the Rotem Sigma, it's the same assays, but just a C at the end, um, showing that it's cartridge based. So if we had to apply this to a real clinical case, how would that work? So here's a 75 year old man with severe bleeding post cardiopulmonary bypass. And we run a TEG 6S on him, gets four simultaneous graphs. So if you look at the kaolin assay, the CK rate R time is prolonged, which suggests coagulation factor deficiency because it's the initial pathway of coagulation. The maximal amplitude of the clot is reduced. So platelet function is reduced. And if you look at the fibrinogen assay, the maximal amplitude is reduced here as well. So it suggests that the fibrinogen reduced as well. Now, when bypass ends, he has been given protamine to reverse the heparin. So if you look at the heparinase assay, the clotting time here and in the kaolin are pretty much similar. So you realize we don't need to give him any more proamine. He's not bleeding because 
there's too much heparin on board. So based on this tag, you give him plasma, fibrinogen concentrate, and a pool of platelets. And there's no need to give him additional protamine because there's no heparin here. TXA has been already given as per protocol. And an hour later, you see compared to this, how the curve normalizes and the parameters all normalize quantitatively and the bleeding stops. So this is sort of one utility in bleed management after cardiopulmonary bypass. This is a second case that we actually saw at our trauma center at Sunnybrook, a pedestrian who was hit um, and had a hemodynamically significant pe pelvic fracture, according to the CRASH-2 protocol, got TXA en route. And if you see his XTEM assay on the ROTEM, there's like virtually no clot. It's a flat line, similarly in the FIPTEM. So that tells us that there's severe coagulation and fibrinogen deficiency, as well as severe hyperfibrinolysis, which is a high predictor of mortality and trauma. So based on this, he's resuscitated just in time with plasma fibrinogen. And given that there's so much hyperfibrinolysis, the TXA is continued as an infusion. And four hours into resuscitation, you see that his curves have improved, his numbers have improved. And although the lab INR and the fibrinogen both did convey that there was a coagulopathy and a hypofibrogenemia. This only was uh, available to us 45 minutes later, whereas this picture was available to us within 15 minutes in the trauma bay. So he was successfully resuscitated and taken to the OR for stabilization of his pelvic fracture. So given that we have some idea now how TEG and Rotem work and how they can be applied to bleeding management in uh, cardiac surgery and trauma, we're just gonna briefly appraise the evidence supporting viscoelastic assays for current indications and some novel indications. So in cardiac surgery trauma, in liver transplant surgery and non-cardiac surgery, as well as pregnancy and obstetrics, these are the four main bleeding indications. In cardiac surgery, we have the maximum evidence. There's been big, a large Canadian cluster multicenter RCT over 7,000 patients, and there have been 15 to 16 small RCTs, many, many observational studies, and five recent meta-analyses. In trauma, there are over 60 observational studies, but only one small RCT single center, a multi-center diagnostic cutoff validation study, and just recently hot off the press published, it didn't make my talk or the education chapter, a multi-center European trauma study, 411 trauma patients. Uh, unfortunately, in non-cardiac surgery and liver disease, very little data. In pregnancy and obstetrics, there have been uh, four reference range studies and two RCTs in postpartum hemorrhage, recently an ISTH guidance, as well as a systematic review. The challenge with the quality of the evidence in all of these indications, as the majority of studies are small, single center, the diagnostic parameters vary quite a lot. There's significant heterogeneity and bias and there aren't reliable estimates of diagnostic accuracy or interobserver reproducibility, and there are varying indications and outcomes. But based on the data that we have, what do we know? So in cardiac surgery, in terms of clinical outcomes, does it reduce TEG and Rotem, reduce blood product use? The answer is yes. Uh, it reduces RBC, plasma, and platelet, as well as post-op blood loss at 12 and 24 hours. And there's a trend towards lower mortality. However, surgical other outcomes, other clinical outcomes like surgical re-exploration rates or length of stay have not been reduced. In trauma, about half of the observational studies show trends towards lower blood product use. Plasma and platelet reduction was seen in the one small single center study. Unfortunately, this la large multi-center study that was just published that compared uh, viscoelastic algorithms to conventional coagulation assays did not show a difference in transfusion. And although the single center small RCT has showed a reduction in mortality, the multicenter RCT did not, except for severe traumatic brain injury. One area in which this technology is helpful is in detecting hyperfibrinolysis, the case that I showed you. It only we only see that in two to 5% of trauma admissions, but it has up to an 80% mortality. So if it can allow us to give TXA for longer, that would be a significant advantage in the small proportion of trauma patients. 
In other non-cardiac surgery, it is being used, but there's insufficient data to conclude that it's beneficial. And in postpartum hemorrhage, the rotem fibtem assay has been validated and useful in guiding fibrinogen concentrate use in postpartum hemorrhage. So what are the novel indications that it's been, it's been sort of argued that if parameters that are hypocoagulable can predict bleeding, then hypercoagulable uh, parameters like fat curves and short clotting times and wide angles could predict hypercoagulability. So there are many, many, many studies in thrombosis, observational studies looking at the postoperative hypercoagulable state in severe sepsis and COVID-19 and malignancy, as well as in complex anticoagulation management like ECMO and LVAD in the management of hemophilia A, because um, you, know, you have to monitor routine factor VIII prophylaxis, assess bypassing agents, assess optimal dosing of factor replacements. But unfortunately, the majority of data in these areas has been descriptive and observational, and there are associations between various parameters and outcomes, but simply associations. So these areas all need rigorous studies, diagnostic accuracy studies, as well as RCTs that will then independent, is independently establish the predictive value of viscoelastic assays. So how would we implement? What do we have to consider? So given that the evidence in this area is still limited, uh, if you're asked to implement TAG or Rotem at point of care at your institution, what you need to know, first of all, you need to assess the clinical need because if your clinical need is simply to improve turnaround times, it's possible that you can do that through the lab by instituting a massive hemorrhage protocol, for instance. Um, the second is, is best transfusion practice already being followed? Because if best transfusion practice is not being followed, then you might attribute benefit to TEG and Rotem, but the only reason you're seeing a reduction in transfusion rates is because the implementation of TEG and Rotem is now suddenly making people you know, focus towards that area and do uh, the, the right thing. It's very important to develop and validate a local clinical algorithm that incorporates these assays. It's very important to liaise with the lab because they're the ones who are going to be able to verify the accuracy and prescription, uh, precision and reference ranges of the parameters locally, train personnel, develop SOPs, and set up a quality management system. And in the absence of cost effectiveness data, it's really important to consider the costs and the benefits because it is very expensive technology to implement and to run. And you have to realize some benefit in terms of reduced transfusion products. So that'd be important to calculate that locally. And finally, uh, in my last slide, I just wanted to indicate what we did at UHN when we first started the process of implementing uh, viscoelastic assays in cardiac surgery. So this was a multidisciplinary effort led by cardiac anesthesia. We validated the FIPTEM Rotem assay, did a retrospective review of a thousand samples, patient samples at the end of cardiopulmonary bypass. And we were able to show that the Klaus fibrinogen in the lab strongly correlated with FIPTEM amplitudes. So an amplitude at 10 minutes of less than eight millimeters of the curve correlated very well with a FIB of 1.5 grams per liter. And um, this was a transfusion trigger for us in cardiovascular surgery. Then uh, we did a pre and post intervention study using the clinical algorithm along with Rotem and a point of care platelet function monitor. And we were able to show that transfusion rates were significantly reduced in the post algorithm phase uh, from the pre algorithm phase. And then finally, Dr. Karkudi led a Canada wide study looking at 12 Canadian hospitals implementing a Rotem based algorithm versus a non-rotum based algorithm uh, in a stepwise fashion and was able to show that this algorithm was externally generalizable. Transfusion rates were significantly reduced for both plasma and platelets, as well as there was a significant reduction in major bleeding. So even though not every center can obviously do such a complex validation, it's really, really important to at least assess the local verification of parameters and to assess um, produce good quality results and set up systems that can um, give you a good cost benefit. So viscoelastic assays have many, many 
uh, advantages. You get complete information on clot formation and lysis. It's well suited for just-in-time decision-making in urgent clinical situations. And conventional coagulation assays actually cannot provide information on hypercoagulability or fibrinolysis. However, we do need rigorous diagnostic accuracy studies to both validate these parameters and multi-center RCTs assessing clinical outcomes and cost effectiveness. And this represents the biggest barrier to adoption of this technology currently. Unfortunately, there's a slippery slope. Extrapolating from cardiac surgery, lots of different areas are using these technologies at their peril because it, they have not been shown to improve outcomes. And the recent trauma RCT actually just proves that. But if you are going to implement it, you, it must be a multidisciplinary team effort to ensure local verification, favorable cost benefit, and provision of high quality results. So thank you. And if there isn't time for questions, feel free to email me later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Selby. It's a fantastic overview of TEG and Rotem. And, and I, I know a few centers around Canada are looking into this technology, so it'll be much appreciated. And while uh, Dr. Wu is uploading her slides, it's a great pleasure to introduce her. Dr. Cynthia Wu is recognized in Edmonton for her expertise in venous thromboembolic disease. Uh, Dr. Wu's medical school and in, in internal medicine residency training was completed at the University of Alberta, followed by hematology residency at McMaster University in Hamilton. She was a clinical scholar and a fellow in thrombosis at the Jurevinsky Center in Hamilton, returning to Alberta finally in 2010 to join the Division of Hematology in Edmonton. Dr. Wu is a thrombosis expert for uh, consultant physicians. She created and is the director of the Cancer Associated Thrombosis Clinic located at the K. Edmonton Clinic. As of 2019, the CAT Clinic has had more than 4,000 patient visits. Dr. Wu is also director of the new thrombosis elective rotation for medical trainees. She's a local principal investigator for various thrombosis clinical trials and heads thrombosis uh, clinical trials within the hematology division. She is the Alberta lead for quality of care and effectiveness research platform of the Canadian uh, Venus Thromboembolic Clinical Trial Network. And finally, she won several awards during her training and academic career, including the an Al University of Alberta Hospital Champion of Care Award, the Michael uh, Menth Award and the Honorable Mention for a Teacher of the Year Award for Subspecialty. It's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, Dr. Wu, and please take over. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to Thrombosis Canada for uh, organizing this very important session. Uh, and I also thank the over 100 participants who've managed to stick around despite us running probably a little bit over time to what you expected. So I'd like to review a pretty massive topic, duration of anticoagulation. So of course, I won't be able to go over everything that you need to know, but I'd like to highlight some of the things that were brought up during this educational session that I think are answer or questions that we have to answer every day when we see patients. And I'll also go over two oral communications uh, that are somewhat related to each other in the uh, area of cancer-associated thrombosis and trying to predict the risk of, can of clot occurrence. So this is just uh, where these uh, presentations occurred for anyone who actually has access to the ASH uh, program and wants to go back and look at more details. So I'll start with the education session first, which was entitled, Who is at High Risk of Recurrent VTE? I would like to start with a little bit of background and some of the slide material is certainly taken from the education session itself, really just highlighting that uh, we know that for adult patients, at least the rough annual incidence of VTE is approximately one in a thousand. It does seem like over a few studies that this might be slowly rising over time, but paralleled as well with a, a graph that was shown in the session, but I didn't have space on the slide to show that maybe there's a declining mortality associated with PE. There has been some hypothesis that maybe we're just picking up smaller PEs on CTs and VQs as the technology gets better. But either way, uh, it's still roughly that one in a thousand per year. We know that there are both acute and chronic complications of DVT and PE. And so it's certainly important to start uh, thinking about how we treat patients and how long. So uh, again, I, I won't have time to go over uh, all of the material inside these two references, but these were highlighted in the education session as some of the most recent guidance statements or guidelines that have come out that help to define what we're talking about when we're talking about short-term treatment versus long-term treatment, what is acute versus chronic phase, and also provoked versus unprovoked uh, risk factors. Uh, and certainly I refer you to these references for more information. 
Uh, along the way, uh, I think um, a lot of, uh, even sometimes doctors, but definitely patients during their course through clots have a hard time wrapping their heads around why they can't just be treated for a little bit longer uh, and then have a lower risk of recurrence. After the first three to possibly six months of treatment, we know that the acute phase of VTE is finished. Uh, and the rate of occurrence no longer changes uh, despite the duration of anticoagulation after that time point. And these two trials are the only trials that demonstrate this, but certainly are some of the, the most nice uh, trials that show some good graphs on PE and DBT. And you can see on the lower uh, bar is uh, the patients who were treated for about a year longer than the patients on the higher uh, line that were treated for six months. And really, while you're on anticoagulation, clearly there's a low risk of recurrence. But once you come off, the slopes of those curves you can see are pretty much the same as the people who came off earlier. And within about a year, the p-value is no longer statistically significant and the, cross, the curves start to cross again. The question really is, who are these people on that steep slope of the curve? And can we identify them and try to target our indefinite duration treatment to those patients? So there are quite a large number of guidance statements, guidelines, expert opinion presentations on who should and should not be on long-term treatment. And probably more recently, uh, a cutoff of about 5% risk of annual risk of recurrent VTE has been used as a little bit of a benchmark over which you would consider a patient for indefinite duration anticoagulation and under which you would consider the potential to take a patient off of anticoagulation. And this is really based on weighing out and balancing the risk of bleeding and clotting and then the most severe consequence of, of fatality afterwards. And with this, and I'll show on the next slide uh, how this potentially can help you split off patients into groups of high and low risk. But I think we also have recognized over the last few years that it's not that simple. Uh, when I was a medical student, it literally was provoked versus unprovoked, and that's it, and you made your decisions. Uh, but now I think we're realizing there's many grades of provoked and unprovoked uh, patients, and it becomes a little bit more complex, and it does require us to have individualized discussions with our patients and constant follow-up and reassessment. This data is presented in many different studies, but uh, the education uh, session presented, provided to uh, the, uh, the more, more recent, I guess, uh, presentations of these numbers. But what you really can take away from this, if you want to round out to some whole numbers that are easier to remember, is that the risk of having a recurrent event after the acute phase of treatment is finished and you stop anticoagulation with a major surgery provoked event is around 1% in that first year after. If you have an unprovoked event, it's roughly 10%. Uh, cancer associated events are usually higher than that, and in some studies, even up to over 20% if the cancer is still active. And for the, everyone else in between, though those are probably the harder ones to try to piece together how long they need to be on anticoagulation. The people who are in between a surgery provoked event and an unprovoked event, because on average, they have about a 5% chance of recurrence per year, which is kind of right on that cutoff that I mentioned on the last slide. But there are some limitations to using that 5% cutoff, even though it seems to be able to differentiate at least a good chunk of patients. As I mentioned, it was based on the bleeding rates and case fatalities of bleeding and clotting. And this was really mostly in warfarin era anticoagulation data. And we know with the direct role anticoagulants, the bleeding rates, the case fatalities, uh, complications, uh, and obviously the ease of continuing anticoagulation are certainly different than for warfarin. And the question remains whether or not this 5% cost is still relevant or whether more patients qualify for longer term anticoagulation. With uh, two of the anticoagulants, apixaban and rivaroxaban, there are also low-dose anticoagulant trials for the longer-term secondary prevention phase. And certainly that may even additionally make the safety of these medications better. Other limitations, uh, again, because the education session also limited time, they really only highlighted the HERDU2 score. Uh, and as Canadians, I'm sure we're all very proud that this was derived in Canada uh, and certainly has undergone probably the most validation of all of the prediction tools that are available out there. But there are a few, so I put some references up there for if people are interested in what else, what other evidence is around. And all of them, as you can see, include a D-dimer in some way, shape, or form. And so the biggest problem with trying to apply these things widely is that not all D-dimer assays are the same. And so there are a few papers, including uh, an analysis by the HERDU2 investigators looking at what happens if you use different D-dimer assays. And unfortunately, the cutoffs and or the results, depending on what uh, outcome they're looking at, are different depending on which D-dimer assay your institution happens to have. 
So I would suggest that a D-dimer can't be used to help you predict, but I think it does require some expert interpretation and hopefully knowing again whether your D-dimer assay is the same as the one that is used in the trial that you happen to be modeling your prediction tool after. And just for your own interest, uh, the HERD U2 score used a D-dimer assay called the VITUS D-dimer. So other limitations that are not very well addressed in most of the tools. Now the HERD U2 does have some parameters for post-traumatic syndrome, but not all, and does not address a lot of the chronic PE symptoms. But it was certainly brought up in this education session that we're pretty bad at uh, assessing a patient for their chronic symptoms and trying to fit that into how we uh, determine duration of anticoagulation. I kind of like to see chronic symptoms not necessarily as a strong risk factor for occurrence, but certainly it could play into how a patient feels about the safety of coming off blood thinners if they're still having a lot of symptoms. They might decide one way or the other. Or also uh, the tolerance of getting another blood clot. If they're already left with chronic symptoms and even if their chance is lower than someone else of getting another clot, the consequences might be higher. So I think we need a lot more uh, research looking into how these factors will play into our decisions as well. So there were special situations that were brought up in this presentation as well too, which unfortunately I don't have time to go over today. But for those of you who have access to the ASH uh, uh, online site, I would certainly recommend you take a look at this. Uh, they did about one or two slides per each of these topics. So it wasn't an in-depth review, but these are very common uh, questions that are asked in clinical practice. So I encourage you to take a look. For those of you who don't have access, ASH will eventually publish all of their education sessions in PDF format that you can download uh, online. And again, I encourage you to take a look uh, at the end product. The final two slides for this particular section were actually really nice graphics that the author uh, and presenter uh, uh, showed. And while it doesn't mean that everyone at the top of these arrows should be on indefinite duration, that everyone at the bottom should be on limited duration, I think it does still highlight a nice spread, so I'm with a sliding scale now instead of, again, what I learned in medical school of just the dichotomized provoked versus unprovoked. I think we're really now talking about some more detailed uh, assessments of these patients. And then the last graphic they put together was to highlight again that it's not a one-time decision. You don't just see a patient on day one and then decide for the rest of their life what they're going to do with their anticoagulants. You're usually seeing them multiple times, and at each time point, you should be discussing these risk factors with the patient. As things can change over time, both with the patient and or with our knowledge, and certainly the reassessment uh, of the patient, particularly the ones you leave on long-term blood thinners, is very important. So with that, I'm going to move on to some of the oral communications uh, for the sake of time. Uh, these are related. Uh, they weren't done by the same authors, but they are related in topic. So what I'll do is I'll put a few slides together that summarizes the background together, and then I will present each of the abstracts individually. Uh, so cancer associated thrombosis, I think we're all quite aware, is uh, certainly a common uh, process. And as uh, you heard from my intro, uh, when I started the Cancer Associate Thrombosis Clinic in Edmonton, I did expect volume, but probably not as much volume as we currently have now, and we're quite overwhelmed with the numbers of people being referred in. So it's definitely a very common thing to occur. And in the world of VTE, we estimate that about a fifth of all VTE occurs in a cancer patient. The question is, how can we predict who's going to get a VTE? Uh, and there have been several scores that have been developed, but none more developed or widely used or validated as the Karana score. And you can see that the advantage of the Karana score is that it is simple. Uh, you don't need a high-tech lab or you know a, a really highly subspecialized uh, uh, doctor to do the score. But as you can see by the simplicity, that there are a lot of factors that we know are risk factors for clotting that do not show up uh, on here. And so sometimes when you're grappling with patients, uh, and I do get patients referred for the reasons uh, such as prior VT to my own clinic, uh, and people are trying to struggle figuring out where they fit into the whole scheme of things. Why is it important to know if a person is going to get a blood clot during their cancer course? We know that it definitely impacts mortality of the cancer patient, impacts morbidity. And even this week, I've had a patient whose cancer treatment was derailed because they developed a massive PE. And so certainly, I, it has clear clinical consequences. There are a large number of trials that are rolled out over time, uh, the most recent one being the DOAC trials in uh, about a year or so ago, uh, looking at trying to select out the right patient for primary prophylaxis. And these are starting to trickle into guidelines, so it certainly is topical to try to figure out what is the best way of predicting who the high-risk population is. 
So I moved to the first abstract. It looked at the impact of ethnicity or race on cancers, the development of cancer associated thrombosis. And we know that in the general population uh, with or without cancer, that uh, there does seem to be an impact. And the African American population seems to be at highest risk, and the Asian and Pacific Islander population seems to be at the lowest risk of developing VTE. Uh, but the question is, does this translate into cancer? And the authors actually initially hypothesized that it would not, that cancer was such a strong risk factor that it would wash out the effect of race because they thought race would be too small of a risk factor to make a difference. This was an administrative database study. Uh, the advantages of those being that you can get tens to hundreds of thousands of patients in fairly short order and have a lot of data to work with. This was in California. They included the 13, the top 13 cancers, which as you can see are very common cancers, and they had over 10 years of follow-up. They did exclude patients with prior VT. So the next abstract, we'll talk a little bit more about that topic. And their primary outcome was the cumulative incidence of cancer-associated thrombosis stratified by race. Uh, they did try to look at some subgroups of VTE, and they tried to correct for as many uh, factors as they could that were available in their data set. So I won't present every single table and chart they have because it's a lot, uh, but I'll try to highlight the ones that are most significant. Their overall uh, population showed that uh, most people had PE, which I don't think is surprising to those of us who take care of cancer-associated thrombosis. A lot of patients get CAT scans regularly, so PE is certainly picked up very frequently. And while it was a multinational group, uh, it was in the United States and California, so the majority of patients were still white. Uh, this is again, uh, I know the, the words on this graph or bar, bar graph might be a little bit small, but uh, I have highlighted the purple bars are the African American patients. The green bars are the Asian and Pacific Islanders. This is their bar graph for PE only. They had graphs again for all the other outcomes of VTE. All the trends were the same, uh, but PE was the most statistically significant in terms of showing that race still had an impact on the outcomes uh, of developing clotting events. This is one of their uh, graphs showing uh, the, um, the multivariate analyses where they tried to correct for other things that might potentially impact the results. And while the trends were also the same in every single other one of these analyses, it was the most pronounced in PE again, where almost despite any cancer, the African-Americans were on the highest uh, end of getting clotting events, and the Asian and, and Pacific Islanders were at the lowest end. So certainly a, a clear trend uh, that can be seen. There are going to be limitations as with all administrative data. It is retrospective. It is based on ICD codes or international classification of disease codes to classify what kind of comorbidities and, and diseases patients have. There are things that cannot be collected in an administrative database that could be very important uh, that may even be linked to uh, race and ethnicity uh, outside of medicine, uh, such as access to care and so forth. And so, uh, so while the data is not perfect, again, at least excuse me, it did include a, a large volume of patients, and, and I think uh, the data is still very powerful. So their conclusions were contrary to what they hypothesized. Uh, it seems that despite cancer and cancer type, uh, the uh, ethnicity of a patient does impact the development of developing a clotting event during their cancer course. And they suggested that uh, we should consider this in our clinical practice and perhaps start including this in future prediction models. For prior VTE, it's a very similar uh, type of study that was done uh, by a different group of investigators. We know, as mentioned in the education session and review, that having a VTE and defining how that VTE occurred is certainly very important in how we manage a patient in the long run. So the question in this study was, does that matter in cancer, or does the cancer also wash out uh, the, any other effect of, of prior VTE? And they also took a look to see if this made a difference to different Quran score groups as well, too. They also use an ICD population, ICD coded population or administrative database. They had a bigger population that accounted for about a sixth of the US population. They excluded patients who had a VTE diagnostic code within one year of the, of the malignant or a cancer diagnostic code. And while they didn't specify this clearly in the, in the presentation, I believe it's probably because they assumed that those were occult cancer associated events uh, and not necessarily just a prior separate event. So I think that was a reasonable thing to do methodologically. They end up having 4 million cancer patients, 200,000 of which had some kind of clotting event or VTE event uh, during their uh, cancer course. This is just the overall data, which already shows a very striking finding. As you can see under the orange bar, which are people who had prior VTE uh, compared to the green bar, which is the people who had no prior VTE, there was an over 10 times higher chance and a pretty significant number that over a third of people had a clotting event during their cancer care. And the basic demographics of patients shown in the table beside are roughly the same. They commented there were slightly higher BMIs uh, in the people with prior VTE, 
but certainly by these numbers was not a dramatic difference. They then tried to tease out whether or not these patients actually just had other risk factors so that would make them at higher risk of getting a blood clot. But interestingly, with maybe the exception of just the anti-neoplastic agents where there was slightly more uh, in the prior VTE group, pretty much every other parameter that we normally associate with having uh, a higher risk of clot, like the type of cancer such as lung cancer or these other chronic score parameters like blood counts, they're actually all lower uh, in the patients who had a prior VTE, which means that that could not explain why they had a 10 times higher risk of having a clot and see much more likely with the actual prior clot and the tendency uh, or the, 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 the ability of a patient to clot so their hypercoagulable state uh, even prior to the cancer was more relevant. And when they turned all the numbers through their multiple very analysis, you can see again, while other things were statistically significant, the odds ratio is clearly higher uh, for a history of VTE compared to these other parameters. When they took a look at cancer types, because that's something we certainly rely on a lot, while it may not look like there is a pattern because some bars are really large and some are really small, if you take a look at the green ones, which are people without a history of VTE, and you compare, for example, pancreatic cancer to breast cancer, you're looking at almost a three times higher risk of, of VTE. But if you take a look at the orange bars, which are people who had a prior history, things are pretty flat. So the difference between 35 to you know 36, 7 percent is not a really big difference. So it does look like a history of VTE washes out even type of cancer. And then when they compare it to the chronoscore, same thing for the green bars, you can see that by high to low chronoscore, there's over doubling of the risk of VT. So the chronoscore is still predictive uh, for the patients without a history of VTE. For those with a history of VT in the orange bars, again, it washed out the chronoscore as well too. So similar limitations we can see as a prior study, it is an administrative database retrospective type study. So you can't account for everything uh, that is important and only what is recorded in the administrative data. But again, they had over 200,000 patients. So I think the quality uh, of the power data was, was quite high. And they did conclude ultimately that having a prior VTE uh, before your cancer did predict uh, quite strongly that you would develop a cancer-associated VTE, and this risk persisted despite other parameters like the Corona score. And so they too also concluded that we should start thinking about including things like this in our clinical practice assessments as well as in future prediction models. So with that, I thank you all for your attention, and hopefully we still have time for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wu. Um, it, it's fascinating that to see that we, we do have clinical models sometimes, but things like ethnicity and prior history of VT can increase the risk further. So it's important to keep in mind for clinical practice. On behalf of Thrombosis Canada and the Association for, uh, sorry, sorry, the Association of Hemophilia Clinic Directors of Canada, I would like to thank everyone for attending tonight's program. I think it was rich and insightful and helpful for clinical practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. Uh, Dr. Selby, Dr. Tagalakis, and Dr. Wu for your engaging presentation, your discussions around that. And also thank you to BMS Pfizer Alliance for the unrestricted grant for this program. Um, and if you are interested in reviewing this program again, please watch our site as it will be posted shortly. And please be sure to complete the evaluation following the program tonight. Visit our website regularly and as often as possible as new material and updates uh, are put on put on on a regular basis. So thank you very much everybody to, to have spent some time with us tonight and have a great night.